5, 2003 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. First item on our agenda, um, call to order, roll call, Dr. Chapmas. Mr. Guglielmetti. Here. Mr. Keneally. Mr. LaPlante. Here. Mr. Mendelson. Here. Mr. Tranfaglia. Absent. And He's here, I believe. He is here? Didn't he just I thought I saw him, yeah. Okay, Mr. Tranfaglia here, but not yet seated. And we'll show Mr. Backer present. Next item on our agenda is to approve the minutes of January 28, 2003. Comments on the minutes, and the only comment I have before we launch into them, Barbara, is that this was <laughs> a great work. piece of work on your part. This by far, I think, was the most challenging set of minutes that you've had to prepare. <clears throat> and you did a very good job getting the essence of the meeting down on paper. But comments on the minutes, suggestions for changes, I have a few, very small ones. Comments from anybody? <clears throat> None, then my only um, changes, small ones, Barbara, mostly um, little things. On page two, um, line 13, I can't quite read what I crossed out because I crossed it out so well. Um, it says construction of the building and something that I've crossed the out. Expressing. And the expressing. The expressing. Yeah. Just delete the word the before expressing. Um, on page five, line 15, it says which was, I think it should be stated instead of instated. On page seven, uh, line 19 and line 21, just for consistency, if we can refer to Dr. Chapmas as doctor instead of Mr. We haven't referred to as Dr. Chapmas in a number of places. So if we can change those two places. And also on line 21, um, it says, Mr. Smith, whether or not the connecting structure. I think we're just missing a, a T. And then on line 46 on page seven, um, I'd like to propose that we strike the words as to whether and replace it with the word that. Page, uh, page seven, line 46 um, in the motion that was presented. Okay. I think it'll make sense if we have the word that instead of as to whether. And that's it. Any other suggestions, comments? Yeah, it didn't match it very well. Um, let's see, on page nine, um, I think line 47 is the first. Uh, word precedence, um, I believe that should be P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T-S. On line one of page 10, um, it should be precedent, P R E C E D E N T. Those are the only two that I classed in addition to what you mentioned. Okay, could we have a motion to approve the minutes with the changes as proposed? So moved. Motion, Mr. LaPlante. Second. Oh, second. Mr. Guglielmetti. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? 
The minutes are approved by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. Um, next item on the agenda, um, old business, to hear the request of Stephen and Lauren LaPlante, 1176 Sawyer Road, tax map U46 lot 10, for a one-year extension of their previously approved variance granted on March 26, 2002, as allowed under Article 5, Section 19-5-4E. Do we have Mr. LaPlante? Yes. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my wife was not able to be present tonight, and we are before you to uh, ask for a one-year extension to the variance that was granted to us a year ago, which is about to expire. Um, <clears throat> we were unable to undertake the project through the course of the year and plan on uh, beginning the project upon the approval here tonight at the beginning of May. So we would need the one year extension to undertake that. Mm. And that, I'll gladly take any questions that you may have. Any questions for Mr. LaPlante? The um, ordinance, um, says the board may grant one extension for up to one additional year upon written request of the applicant. Um, there are no conditions, uh, no other uh, restrictions in the ordinance. Um, see no reason why the board shouldn't approve mm -hmm. the one year extension as requested. Um, Mr. Chair. In the past, um, we've made clear to the record that, that, that uh, establishing that, that there's been no change that would affect the previously approved variance. So you may want to ask Mr. LaPlante if there has been. As far as I, I know, I took a ride down the area and there's nothing that, that I could see that would, would influence. Um, and Mr. LaPlante may be able to tell you the same thing. As to whether there's been any change as to what? Any, anything that may change the, uh, the effect of the variance, such as somebody else building, you know, for instance, if you had a, an issue with, with granting the variance in case somebody else built too close, if somebody else had built <clears throat> close and you would, you would look at that last year, um, that may influence you, your reapproval of the variance. That's just an example. Mr. LaPlante, any changes in the surrounding property, abutting your property? No, there, uh, there are no, no changes to speak of to the uh, surrounding properties, the surrounding structures, or to our plans as we appeared before you uh, last year. The plans remain intact as presented. No change other than the fact that the Earth has gone one more time around the sun. Yes. We last granted it. <laughs> Anything else, Mr. Smith? That's all I have. Okay. Comments? Questions? Mr. LaPlante, <clears throat> have there been any changes in the, uh, your reasons for applying for this variance? Uh, your primary reason was a health issue, I believe. Were there any changes in that or any other supporting uh, issues? No. The, um in the original application, the conditions that we spoke of, um, those, it continues to, to be the case today. Uh, the factor for not undertaking the job last year, shortly after the variance was granted, was um, it was more of a timing. Uh, we found ourselves uh, in, in a difficult position of trying to find a contractor to complete the job. We had aligned ourselves with a contractor and uh, through the interim of our application, he took another job that took him well into the fall, and by then it was too late to him for, to, for him to start. If you may recall, winter came pretty early last year and, and certainly stayed its full duration. Um, so through the five through five months of that variance, we were unable to take the job that wouldn't have been um, prudent or you know would have opened ourselves up to a great deal of liability. 
so we held off until spring it just happens to coincide with this variance expiring thank you hearing no other comments um, could I have a motion uh, from someone to approve the request of Stephen and Lauren LaPlante, 1176 Sawyer Road, tax map U46, lot 10, for a one-year extension of their previously approved variance granted on March 26, 2002, as allowed under <coughs> Article 5, uh, Section 19-5-4E of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. Excuse me, may I ask a question, Mr. Smith? Before? Sure. Uh, or notices resent out regarding this? Yes, they were. Okay. And does this, if this is not acted upon, does this transfer with the property if the property is sold in the interim period? <clears throat> you mean if, if, if he didn't act on it and it was sold within the year time frame, That's would fair. it? I within believe so. Extension period, does it? Does the variance or extension of the variance transfer with the property, or does it cease to be valid upon sale? I believe the answer is yes, uh, simply because it it, it is a, uh, recorded at the registry as a as a document. Yes, it would transfer. It would transfer. <clears throat> Thank you. Excuse me for interrupting. Would anyone care to make such a motion? I'll, I'll move. Uh, Mr. Trantfaglia? Second. Uh, second, Mr. Mendelson. Uh, discussion on the motion? All those in favor? The motion is approved by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed, and we will show Mr. LaPlante as not participating in the proceeding. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the next item on our agenda is new business. And item number one of new business is to hear the request of Thomas S. Hill Sr., 53 Cliff Avenue, tax map U01, lot 83, for a conditional use permit for an accessory dwelling unit. Mr. Hill? If you would um, state your name and address for us, please. Thomas S. Hill Sr. Uh, 53 Cliff Avenue, Cape Elizabeth. Mr. Hill, the floor is yours. I'm uh, looking for approval on, on an accessory drilling, uh, commonly known as an in-law apartment. Uh, my son lives in the main house. Uh, we intend to live in the apartment. We're relocating back to the state from out of state. So this is, um, your, your son will live in the apartment? He lives in the apartment? apartment, he and his family. No, my wife and I will live in the apartment. So you own the house, you and your wife? I own the house. Um, and the intention is for you and your wife to move out of the main house and into, into the, the new apartment. apartment. And your son lives in the house with you now? Yes. With his family? His wife and two children. Okay. Um, before we go any farther, I had one question. Uh, Bruce, if you could tell me if I'm looking at the right thing here. <clears throat> On um, one of the requirements for the creation of an accessory dwelling unit 
under the ordinance is that the lot, and I'm looking at page 134, um, is that the lot have a minimum of 12,000 square feet to be eligible for the addition of an accessory dwelling unit. And then the ordinance says the applicant shall have the burden to establish the lot area by a survey signed and sealed by a registered main surveyor. Is what we have sufficient to meet the requirement under the ordinance? Okay, the applicant shall have the burden. We have never required a full survey for an accessory dwelling unit. Yes. We could do that, but in the past, I've never seen the board require that. Okay. But under notes, there. Jack, the what do you paragraph. <clears throat> Under notes here, the like a survey has determined that the property still exceeds 12,000 square feet. In the last the second paragraph, last sentence. It, it, right, it, and it. It seems obvious from what we have that we have a lot of greater than 12,000 square feet. Um, this is a sketch plan, uh, which is which is much more accurate than a mortgage inspection plan, of course, uh, to the to the degree that, that, that they'll stand behind it, um, pretty much 100 percent. They did find that there might that, that for actual precise measurements that that, that the foundry survey might follow, but. Um, Sketch plans tend to be fairly accurate, or as, as accurate as can be without doing a full survey. <clears throat> Does it say any place? What is the square footage of the line? I mean, it looks like it's a little bit over 12. I was sketch plan down. Is there a number here? That <clears throat> Oh, I see 12,875. I think the, the tax assessor's records indicated a few feet under. Uh, and that's why there was a uh, sketch plan done to see if he could get if there was over 12, which they thought it was based on a deed. Uh, so that's why they went to the, that added expense to do the sketch plan. <clears throat> well, if this has sufficed in the past, um, um, that, yes, it that's, that's fine. If the board, you know, I think what that means, if the board had Problems if they didn't, if they wanted to definitely know that it was 12,000 square feet, if they had doubts that it was, um, then they certainly could send the applicant away and, and have them come back for the survey. That option's there. Um, What's the town zoning map say for us? The town zoning map shows, I, and I don't, well, maybe I do. Um, I think it's just a set, just a few feet under. I think so. Okay. I mean, like it's been a year and a half. ten feet or something. It's some really small number, uh, maybe even a couple. Um, let's see, eighty-three. Eighty-three. Yeah, right I'm just gonna wait it out. We put the lines across them and it walks out to square footage. So I don't have that information here. I can go get it, but the tax assessment maps are strictly for, for assessing purposes, though. So um, you can't put too much accuracy in the size. So would, would the tax assessor's records get corrected by this? Sketch plan or what, what's the last seat that's here? Um, I don't I don't know whether he, he'd use a sketch plan to do a correction or not. It wouldn't affect him anything as far as assessing goes. Um, certainly it would be nice to have the wreckage 
reflect that it's yeah, like, 12,000. Yeah, so, you know, if, if we go ahead and prove it, it would be nice to have the records reflect that, in fact, it really Yeah, I, I don't know that that's something he'll be comfortable with or not. I'd have to ask him. Um, like I say, we use this as his records because that's all we have as far as maps go, but yeah. um, they're for a completely different purpose. Yep. You're right. It would be nice <coughs> to have everything. Yeah. And I would guess that the assessor wouldn't change their records based on this because it actually, the, the note that Mr. Guglielmetti pointed out actually says for precise square footage we recommend a boundary survey. For a sketch plan, do they do any surveying at all? It says there's two found or rebar, re, rebar uh, found markers or three. They, they, they locate rebar. Um, they, they do GPS. They do GPS um, instrumentation. They do B by D descriptions, tax assessors maps, other survey plans that may have done in the area, and they try to come up with something that's that's accurate. And sometimes it, they they have no problem in saying exactly what it is. Other times they they have to take put notes on here and recommend that if you need to be more precise, then 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 they have to do a survey. Uh, but it's a it's a fairly it's a fairly mm -hmm. uh, um, Historically, accurate. it's pretty accurate relative to a boundary survey. In the yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, certainly not as good as a boundary survey, but it's they'll stand behind it in, in most, most cases. But you don't tell applicants that they need a survey. I haven't been no. I certainly can do that in the future if, if the board thinks that's something that should be entertained. Well, in a lot of cases, it may be fairly obvious, you know, one way or the other. This one happens to be right. so close. And I, I guess with, you know, one of the, the, the only existing town records showing that less than 12,000, I, I didn't know that when I asked the question. I, I don't want to require that anybody incur needless expense. And I realize that's why we don't want to require surveys, because they are expensive. Well, I, from, from, if the board is looking to, to, for a document to, to, to reinforce that it's 12,000, you should look to the sketch plan before you should look to the, to the town assessor's records. Because certainly that's, that, that, that not their only purpose is for assessment. Uh, and they may or may not be What's, what's the what's the origin of those records? Isn't it from an original survey? When the area was not necessarily, no. <laughs> Could be from an old subdivision that, that was done in 1900. Right, and chains. Um, could be from a survey. Could be from a deed description. Um, it's it's from whatever the town gets to, to to plot it on the map, and they don't necessarily verify to any accuracy. Well, I'm inclined to rely on the statement in the sketch plan where they say that monuments found are old and do not exactly agree um, with the dimensions on the deed, but they, it goes on to say, however, even when the discrepancy between the monuments and the deed references are considered, total area still exceeds 12,000 square feet. Um, what's the sentiment of the board on this? What's the distinguishing factors? Um, a survey is, of course, exactly that. They 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 find the lines and, and put their stamp on it to its accuracy. A sketch plan they'll do only if there's enough information available so that they're comfortable in doing the sketch plan. If they get to a point where they they don't feel comfortable that the sketch plan is going to be accurate enough for the need then they'll recommend to the client that, that they can't do the sketch plan and they'll say that, you know, we can only sign off on a survey. So if you see a sketch plan, you usually can, can have pretty good confidence that, that, that they're confident, otherwise they wouldn't have put it down on a sketch plan, if that helps any. That, but it's not a legal survey. So 
the level of due diligence that the engineer uses to establish boundaries in a sketch plan, if I'm understanding correctly, does not rise to the level of a survey. That's correct. Oh, would the, the rebar uh, and the iron pipe, um, what is the legal value of those compared to some definition of points in some original survey that may have been done when this property was first subdivided? Only to the extent that you can compare them to the deed description or something else, um, they can they could be equal or, or which has precedence is what I'm asking. The, the definition by coordinates in the original survey or the placement of pipes. Well, if there's an original survey, then you we wouldn't be in this in, in this predicament to begin with. Is, um, well, the. Okay, I'm assuming that some kind of survey was done, but maybe I could be wrong, but he's saying the monuments do not exactly agree with dimensions as described in the deed. Now, I'm assuming that the deed referred or incorporated a, a survey at some point. I could be wrong on that, but well, uh, that there was. One, one might assume that, that because this is part of an original subdivision that, that, that there probably was survey work done. Right. Um, yes. So, so my question is, he's already acknowledged that there's a discrepancy between what the original deed says and what the pipes say. So which has precedence legally? Well, certainly the pipes can be moved. So I would say it, it's more on meets and bounds in the deed description. I'd say there'd be more precedence set with that than there would be iron pipes because iron pipes get moved all the time. They, Do they? Some have feet, yeah. <laughs> Jump all around. Because this sketch plan relies heavily on the placement of the pipes. Or the coordinates. In fact, there's no pipe at all, as far as I can tell, on the front uh, right corner. Well, the pipes, the monuments found do not exactly agree with the dimensions described on the locust deed. So I'm not sure if it, I'm not sure if it relies heavily on it. I, I think it relies on both, and and based on what they found, that uh, even with the discrepancies, um, they've made the statement that it exceeds the 12,000 square feet. So I think they're relying on the fact that there are two different ways to get there, and neither one of them are quite accurate. Um, but they end up making the statement that it is over 12,000 either way. So. Um, and while the iron pipes are depicted in the sketch plan those may not be the only reference points that they were taking. Is that correct? That's correct. Sketch plans run, I, I, mean, I don't know what you paid, but they run approximately 500 or so. I think 300. 300. Well, you got a bargain. <laughs> I don't think it was. When, when, he present, when, when this was presented to the, uh, remember when we tried to get applicants to, to do surveys. Well, this, this is a special case because this... this no, I understand that. I understand in this that. case, it says the burden um, is on the applicant to actually have a survey signed. So. Yep. And if the board isn't comfortable with that, then... then um. On this sketch plan that we have, um, Mr. Hill, it has the one-and-a-half-story dwelling chartered in, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have the garage or the in-law apartment chartered in. The, the, those those seem to be just drawn in. I just drew those in. Those weren't done. Those, that's an addition to the house. You got a single family, a permit for a, a single, single family, family house, and then we put a two-car garage on it with additional rooms behind it. Um, and that was done when? in the process of finishing up right now. And the status of construction on that is, is what? Uh, it 
put in the flooring you now, and to the, the death, one of the bathrooms. Probably a couple of weeks for the addition to be done. Nothing's been done with the, with the kitchen or anything. Nothing can be done with the kitchen until after this approval because he did come in. Um, the ordinance does require that you, there is language in there that says you can't, can't you, you're restricted to what you add on for an accessory dwelling unit. And, and, and the simple solution to that is, and not to say to get around the, the ordinance, but the simple solution is that for is an applicant to come in and get a permit for a single family addition, which is what the applicant did without a kitchen. And then, um, I recommended that, that when he get it almost done, to the extent where he could get occupancy as a single family addition, that that's when he approaches the board to get approval for an accessory dwelling unit with a kitchen. So although it, it, it may not meet the, the straight face test if you, if you look at it as being done from day one as an accessory dwelling unit, it's certainly by, by getting a permit for a single family dwelling addition, um, it's, it's legal. Uh, it's, you know, I, I'm not sure why they, they put the language in there to begin with, especially since you could do this in any given time. So that's why you, you see the drone the way it was. He, yes, his plans were, were to end up with, with, a, with an accessory dwelling unit. And, and that's why he had this plan done to go to this board. And that's why the, the, the addition wasn't on there because it wasn't done at that point. So the kitchen is the key ingredient is what you're saying. You have to that's correct. Actually, finish off the kitchen as a kitchen until you. That's correct. The, okay. And that's this, this back room to the right. Is that the intended kitchen? Yep. What's the additional expense, Bruce? Typically, of a, of a true survey. Well, as near as I can tell, a simple survey with with no. Snags probably is going to run twelve hundred bucks. It's uh, and a sketch maybe, plan? Maybe a little less, but what's that? And and the cost of a sketch plan? Well, and that was what I was going to say not earlier that, that that when they when we had that issue with what we should require, sketch plans were running. He had told us they're running around four fifty, but uh, Mr. Hill evidently it was fairly simple to do this and. It cost him 300 so. But typically it's around 450 to $500. <clears throat> now, are there other places in the ordinance that require a survey where the board doesn't actually require a survey, at least that it hasn't historically? Other things that you can think of? Well, see, I'm not, I mean, I, I don't think this requires it. I think they have the burden to establish a lot area by a survey if, if the need it rises. I think if it's obvious that in this case it's not, no, but I think it's obvious you've got 80,000 square feet and you only need 12 that, that you don't really have to have a survey to prove that. So I think it's, I think it's somewhat optional in that case. But yes, there is a section where the court officer can require a, a survey for any time he, he issues a building permit if he's not comfortable with the, with the accuracy of the site plan. Um, I've never done that. Uh, I require the applicant to submit an accurate, survey, uh, an accurate site plan, and I don't care how they get there um, as long as it's accurate. So. Well, where does the board want to go with this before we <laughs> go, go any further? <laughs> I, I, I hesitate. I hate to add additional expense on, but I, this one is a little bit murky, and I'd, I'd really strongly prefer to have a survey before we give it approval. If I understand you correctly, Bruce, it's your contention that this language only indicates where there is some doubt that the applicant is then saddled with the burden of obtaining a survey. But in, in this instance, since there's this uh, uh, sketch plan, uh, 
that seems to indicate clearly that there is adequate square footage here, that there isn't doubt, and therefore there is no burden to go forward with a survey? Well, maybe I should back up. I think probably this section, if somebody really wanted to take the stand, that the board should be requiring survey any time they're in doubt at all. I guess I took a broad discretion here at all. This is ... I think I put a lot of faith in the sketch plan that surveyors do, especially not these civil solutions, because I don't think you'd make statements on here without being accurate, because they do have licenses to lose, although this isn't a stamped document, so maybe they wouldn't lose their license. But, you know, they don't have a lot to gain. They have more to gain if they don't put the statements on, because now they can get a full survey. So I put quite a bit of faith in the sketch plan myself. I think the accuracy is pretty darn good most of the time. Part of the answer to your question is, as Bruce said earlier, if the lot was 3,000 square feet, then there wouldn't be any question about it. Well, yeah, but I think the issue here is, is this in fact a requirement, or is there any discretion here on the part of the board? Well, since you never required it before, I would ... It's a little inartfully drafted, and as a result of that, the board's in a position where you really have to ... At least I will accept that the lot is, in fact, greater than 12,000 square feet. But we may not, as a board, we may not have the discretion to waive a requirement that's in the ordinance. I didn't ... Your point is a good one, and I didn't read the ordinance the way Bruce just described it. However, when he made the statement, I can see how that's a fair reading of it. If somebody comes in and they have a two-acre lot, I think it doesn't make sense to require that they bring in a survey unless there is some question about the size of it, in which case the burden falls on the applicant. I think that's a fair way to read it. Well, I think you have to also look at what the board has considered in the past, and although we've never been in this situation, there's never been a survey that ... I'll put it accessory to all in the unit since I've been here in five and a half years. There has ... There hasn't been. There's never been a survey required? There hasn't ever been one required. That's not to say it's ... Well, that's good guidance. Or it could be that the board has ignored the ordinance for five years. I agree, Jay. Or we've never been this close. We've never had this kind of ambiguity in a situation where the zoning regulations say that ... or apply strongly and say that the burden is on the homeowner in a survey to clarify the ambiguity. That's the thing that causes me pause. Well, you're saying we've never had a case that has been so close to 12,000 feet where there's ... Well, for an ADU. There's no other part of the zoning regulations that have this statement about the burden being on the homeowner. As far as I know. As far as I know. You're right. So it's only the ADU application that brings this into play. And in the ADUs that we've considered, and we have had a few of them, I don't think we've had one where there's been any question about the size of the lot. Does ... Well, Mr. Hill, I'm sorry I brought this up. But now that it's on the table, we do need to address it. Mr. Trantaglia. Well, I guess I feel comfortable with the sketch plan, especially not only because of the comments of the civil engineer, but the fact that there's a level of consciousness. I mean, why did he comment about 12,000 feet? I mean, he did this sketch, I think, with that question in mind. And he caged his answer by saying, either you go by the rods or the deed description, there's some discrepancies, but however you calculate it out, you're still over this. That was the question, do I have 12,000 feet? And I don't think he would have ... the practice would ... excuse me ... would not be to issue a sketch plan if he really was, you know, I think on the fence, pardon the pun, 
I think he's probably right. Yeah. As Bruce said, I think it's the greatest likelihood is he's, he's right. This just doesn't have the legal stature that a full survey does. True. I just sort of, we, we are supposed to operate in a quasi-judicial manner, and so I'd like to be sure that we do things with, you know, the legal stature necessary to show the integrity of whatever we do. Yep. Well, but I think to do that, it still comes back to the interpretation of the ordinance here. And, and uh, uh, I, I think what, what, what we need to do is, is uh, um, move with the application and see uh, how many strict constructionists there are on the board. I, I certainly am satisfied that, that, that the, uh, uh, the, the property meets the, meets the uh, minimum square footage requirement. I don't, I don't have any problems with that. My, my only issue is again, is, is whether or not we're bound to, 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 to interpret this, this ordinance uh, to mean that there is an absolute requirement for a survey. Uh, you know, if it's been interpreted that, that in the past. Because of the quasi-judicial nature of, of our responsibility, it's my opinion, it's only my opinion, I guess, that, that, that our opinion of the value of this actually has no value at all. This is not a legally meaningful thought. It's a guiding thought, but it's not a legally meaningful in the same way as a survey. <clears throat> is that I have to say it's ninety nine percent I feel ninety nine percent comfortable it's probably right, but I don't think that has any meaning. Uh. Mr. Smith, do you know, does a sketch plan correlate with the market survey, Class D survey, as far as uh, legality or validity? Or, are these two documents comparable? No. No, this is, this is much more accurate than a mortgage inspection plan ever thought of being. Mortgage inspection plan simply locates a house and, and either says there's violations or setbacks or there isn't. That's all it does. So is, is a sketch plan then considered more accurate or less accurate? Oh, much more accurate. Okay, but less accurate than the standard boundary survey. Not exactly. Um, when Northeast Civil Solutions presented the, their, the, the argument to, to the board that a sketch plan through the letter several years ago that a sketch plan would be a, is a good document to use, as part of that argument was that if, if they weren't comfortable doing the sketch plan, then they don't do it. And, and the burden and the, and, the, and the applicant or the person they're doing the work for are uh, told that they, they, if they want accuracy, then they have to do a, a survey. So normally, in nine times out of 10, they don't even do the sketch plan. They don't even get that far unless they, can, unless they have a degree of accuracy that they're comfortable with. The According to the, to the title on this document, this is recorded. This is a recorded document. Is that correct? Which one? The sketch uh, plan? Sketch plan. No, I don't believe well, it so. It shows deed book, and it gives a reference for a deed book and a page number. Does that indicate that this is recorded then? No, that's... that's um, At the top. That's, that's the deed. Uh, uh, at, at the center of the top, where mm -hmm. 53 Cliff Avenue Assessors Map U1 Parcel 83, Deeds that's, Book that, 11022. That's a deed. Okay. That's a deed. Okay, but that's so. This is not a recorded document. Then. The sketch plan is not. No, it's the sketch plan is based on the <coughs> deed and I and Pins file. What my consideration on this that if Northeast Civil Solutions points out the discrepancy and uh, yet makes the statement that 
the area of the property still exceeds 12,000 square foot feet. Uh, for them to record this as a note, to me, lead some credibility to their interpretation of this overall sketch plan, or they wouldn't have wouldn't have indicated that. And to me, that that has significant weight for them to make that statement in writing, uh, and with the understanding that this is even recorded in the deed book. But this is not a registry document. That's why this has no legal standing. And the fact that on the town's tax records, do you know the exact number, Bruce, we have for square feet there? Is it 11,990? You want to go get that, Barbara? Anyway, on the town's tax records, that implies that a true survey was done at some point showing it's been less than that one. Uh, so that implies that the only, again, there's still ambiguity. The strongest implication is that the only true survey we know of showed it to be slightly under 12,000 square feet. It's my understanding that that does not imply that a true survey was done, that those, uh, the basis, and you may correct me with this, but the basis of the lot size is recorded in the assessor's tax map uh, is based on a number of issues, one of which is an aerial survey uh, that is uh, an approximate square footage of a lot size. And I do know that for a fact. Uh, I'm familiar with a lot personally that 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 has uh, uh, there is some discrepancy between the tax map, and I'm aware that this takes place. So it's not necessarily based on a true survey. But I think it probably is. It's not necessarily, but it probably is. When this subdevelopment was was established and the land was divided, there probably was a survey done, and that's probably the basis. Are the square footage numbers that are currently in the tax center's office. Bottom line is this is not a survey. It is a sketch plan. It can't be recorded as, as being accurate right. uh, to that extent. Uh, and if the board isn't comfortable with that, then, then we need to move on and, and advise the client that, uh, uh, the applicant, that they need to submit something else. Um, I think we've and I don't want to, I just don't want to belabor this anymore. I, we need to, and I'm not the chair, <laughs> I'll back off. Well, no, it's an interesting discussion because um, we've never gone down this road before. Are we able to, to grant a conditional use just subject to the uh, provision of a, of a survey so that Mr. Hill wouldn't have to come back? I, I was thinking that, but I, I think you, if you're not comfortable with the square footage, then I think you need to, to wait until you find the square footage. I don't think you should do it conditional upon, personally. If you have a problem with the sketch plan and don't, don't know that it's accurate, then I think you need to advise the appellant and have him come back with something more accurate. Did she just the, provide you the actual square footage? On the 11 979. 11 979. By tax assessor's figures. 21. Square feet under. 11,979. Now, Bruce, in terms of sur a true survey, what's the, ac what's the typical accuracy? That, it's got a stamp on there, then it's accurate. But, you know, is, Period. is the sum established plus or minus that normally goes with a survey? I don't recall that surveys or in pluses and minuses. I mean, I guess I, I really didn't, never looked at that. I thought when a survey was done, that meets and bounds were, were exactly what to what that surveyor had found. Uh, I may be wrong on that. I really haven't, haven't paid that much attention to it. But I believe a survey is, is you know, surveys can differ. That's why they can differ. And plus and minuses, I don't believe you'll find on surveys. I may be wrong, but I don't believe you will. Anybody know that? <laughs> I thought there was some standard deviation uh, allowed. And the, the, well, the, gentlemen, time to <coughs> move this forward. Um, 
the quandary that you may be in, and, and I don't like to bring this up because I, I mean, certainly I, I think the sketch plan is a good, accurate plan, but the quandary you're in is that, that, that if you approve this and there isn't 12,000 square feet, there's no recourse for the appellant because you can't, this board can't grant a variance to, to, to a lot size, um, whether it be for single family dwelling or use that's on the lot. So I, I don't know what the recourse would be. So if you're not comfortable with the sketch plan, then, then um, that ought to weigh in with it. But I mean, I, I don't want to say anything to, to make this not work because you know, I think the, ac the accuracy is there, but to the extent that it's over 12,000. But that's something to consider. Well, I realize this is a close call. Um, I'm willing to accept the figures on the sketch plan, but I, I'd like to hear six other voices before we go forward. Well, uh, I'll give you my voice. My, my position is that if we have some discretion to interpret this ordinance, then I'm uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, David. I'm, I'm willing to accept the, uh, the uh, validity of the sketch plan. I would be inclined to uh, view it the same way as well. I don't believe that the assessor's numbers carry any greater weight. As a matter of fact, I think they may carry less weight than this sketch plan. I think I would agree as well. I mean, for this. Uh, Civil Solutions to put their stamp on this document as well. <clears throat> I think they must have a minimum amount of uh, found coordinates that would reassure them that the, in order to justify this this document that they felt comfortable in, in doing it. I would say that if they didn't find, if they had found one rebar found, they may not have uh, you know, completed this document. So I, I feel comfortable with what this says. I agree. And actually, even if they didn't find any of the rebars, they, they're referencing the tax assessor's map and that, that mapping, and they went out and recalculated it. They didn't get the same number. Then they went by the rebars, and they didn't get the same number. And I think just by way of process, I mean, historically, for five and a half years anyways, we know that um, we've accepted a sketch plan when the civil engineer has been confident with it. And I think now we're, we're questioning that whole process. I mean, I have no, if, if, if he's comfortable, no matter how you calculate it out, and the difference, I can't do math in my head very quickly, but that's less than, you know, a 20th, a, you know, 20th of a one fifth of a 1%, uh, the difference. And I don't know. I, I have full confidence in the sketch plan. Well, it sounds like we have at least a majority to go forward on that basis. Well, then well, let's move on to other comments and questions that board members might have. Well, if I may. <laughs> you may. It's another calculation in my, in my calculator. The battery just went out. Um, Mr. Smith, if you could, if you could help me with, uh, in the ordinance under section 1975, I have last year's book, which is page 138, which I think is a couple of pages up from the yep. current one. Under section number four, under requirements, so is any addition to the floor area of the single family detached dwelling to create the accessory dwelling unit shall not exceed 15% of the floor area of the structure of the single family dwelling prior to conversion? And I was trying to use those numbers. There's no addition for the accessory dwelling unit. There is no addition. Okay. The addition was for a single family addition with the intent to come after the addition was done to this okay. board for accessory dwelling unit. That was the, the thing that I said that okay. <laughs> it may not be then the numbers fit. Okay. The best way to do it, but it's the only way to do it if you need the space. So if there had been a request to build the addition as an accessory dwelling unit, this wouldn't have been permitted. Correct. This is something that, that has come up before even with this board and, and um, and the board even realized that that's a, I, I, I hate to use a way, way around the ordinance, but that's the way that applicants can approach it if they don't meet the figures. They, they get their approvals, they build it as a single family addition, and then they come in. And it's been done often. 
Other comments, questions for Mr. Hill? Well, let's look down through the, the requirements. Uh, first one, 12,000 square feet. It looks like we've addressed that one. Um, number two. Um, it's like we had a minimum of at least 1,500 square feet, correct? According to the survey or the drawing we have, the area of the existing house is 2,500 square feet. Uh, number three, accessory dwelling unit shall occupy no more than 25% of the resulting floor area. Everybody agree we seem to be okay on that? 2,500 square foot house, 581 foot in-law apartment. It's between 300 and 600 square feet. Um, item number four that Mr. Trenfaglio was referring to um, apparently does not apply. Um, item number five, one parking space shall be provided for the accessory dwelling unit in addition to the parking for the single family detached dwelling. Mr. Hill, can you address the, the parking? Uh, there are four spots. And are those um, in the, the driveway? Uh, there are probably two in the driveway, but they're, the, the garage is so we have a two-car garage? Two-car garage. And the driveway is at least five feet from the side and rear property lines? It's, the driveway actually hasn't been put in at this time. It's coming uh, shortly but it will be five feet from the property line. It will probably be a great deal of distance, a great further, or longer, wider distance than that. <laughs> and you're not changing the exterior of the dwelling at all for the uh, no, single family? No, matched it pretty well, I think. Except uh, I'm sorry? for the roof line. The roof <coughs> line changes a little bit. Well, but you're not you're not changing it from what's there existing. No. And is there any home occupation or home business no. that's conducted? And the entire property is owned by you and your wife? Uh, yes, sir. Questions about any of those requirements? Well, that takes us then to page 54 of the ordinance. If, um, and those are standards for conditional use approval, which is 19-5-5D. So we need to run through those elements. Um, are there any conditions that the board sees as appropriate 
to assign to the granting of the application. Hearing none, um, number two, next uh, element is that the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions. Any issues there? No. Questions? Um, number three, proposed use will not create un unsanitary conditions. Are you going to vote on these? We use um, I will. I just wanted to run through and see if there were any, if there was any discussion that was required before we voted on them. Oh, okay. Um, I don't hear any issues coming up. Um, adverse effect on adjacent property values. Compatible with adjacent property uses. Okay. Well, then let's vote on those if there's not going to be any discussion or issues about them. Um, a show of hands from board members who find that the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. That is found in the affirmative seven in favor, uh, zero opposed. Um, all those who find that the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation. That is found in the affirmative, seven in favor, zero opposed. Uh, next, those who find that the proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. Found in the affirmative, seven in favor, zero opposed. Uh, next, those who find that the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with the comprehensive plan. Found in the affirmative, seven, seven in favor, zero opposed. And last, um, those who find that the design and external appearance of any proposed building, well, in this case, we don't have a proposed building. All right. Uh, so number six is not applicable. <clears throat> and um, no conditions, correct? And could I have a motion from someone to approve the application of Thomas S. Hill Sr. Uh, for a conditional use permit for an accessory dwelling unit at 53 Cliff Avenue, tax map U01, lot 83. Anything else needed to be added to that? No. Nope. Should the square footage of the accessory dwelling unit be included in the... In the uh... um, I don't think it needs to be. That was an essential element of our approval. Where is that? Pardon? It is not clear where that comes into... Uh... What we voted on. The square footage? Um, well, it's not in what we've voted on, but before we can um, go to the conditional use permit, we have to have found that the various elements under nineteen seven five on page one thirty four um, were met. And that's where the 12,000 square foot requirement came in. Um, we can go through and vote on those separately, um, if you would like. And there are eight of those elements. No, I'm not, I'm not do you want to include the motion to size the dwelling unit? Is that what you? I was just a little surprised that that. The square footage of the 
dwelling unit and the fact that it's less than 25% of the total floor year is not in something that we voted on. So I'm not suggesting that we go back and create more votes for ourselves. Well, the record speaks for itself. Uh, I know. Yeah. The only reason I brought up Mr. Backer on the public notice, it just had the uh, request for conditional permit for accessory dwelling unit. In our worksheet of finding facts, we, in the title, we also stuck, stuck in the amount of square footage. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think it needs to be there. I was just wondering why there was a discrepancy between the two. Well, the first finding of fact, actually, the first finding of fact, which we didn't really vote <coughs> on, per se, but Thomas and Molly Hill, the owners of a property at 53 Cliff Ave, tax map U01, lot 83, which is in the residential C district, containing 12,000, I guess that should be a common period, 12,000 square feet, plus or minus. The plus or minus is an interesting thing. Well, it shouldn't be. 12,000 square feet. Okay. Or, say, or containing at least. At least. Yeah. Or not less than. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Plus or minus 21. Yeah, no, that, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Maybe that's why I put that in there because. <laughs> that gets us past that hurdle. <laughs> Good catch, Jack. Right. <clears throat> well, let's have a separate. Uh, finding all those who find that Thomas and Marley Hill are the owners of a property at 53 Cliff Avenue, tax map U01, lot 83, which is in the residential C district, containing not less than 12,000 square feet. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. Now you do have other findings in here, uh, Bruce, as to the existing floor area. I'm not quite sure why the existing floor area was picked out. Well, because that's just to show that, that it's, it's not more than 25% of the... Well, now you're, now you're leading me to believe that we should go through well, all the elements. I only put them in there to suggest the findings. You, don't, you, can, you can take any and all of them out. Could we say the existing floor area is 3,084 square feet and the accessory dwelling unit area is 581 square feet? Well, up top it, it states it. That's what he's asking for, but sure. But, uh, I'm under the finding of facts, I'm saying. So we just okay, sure. Or how about this? Could we add another finding that um, says that the uh, requirements of 19-7-5B are satisfied? Sounds good. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. Well, in that case, let's add that, Bruce, to the proposed uh, form of the, of the findings and order um, instead of number three as written that says the existing floor area is 3,094 square feet. Let's just add uh, a statement that says the requirements of section 19-7-5B are satisfied. Well, then you can eliminate number one because that's included in, in the conditions and the requirements. Yeah, that's what they overlap. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have a little bit of overlap there on, on number one and three, but I guess that's okay. All right, we have our findings. Um, did we just did we just vote on this last one on the? I think we did. We that the uh, requirements of 19-7-5B have been met. Yeah. That was found in the affirmative, seven in favor, zero opposed. So now back to the motion. Um, if we could have a motion from someone to approve the application of Thomas S. Hill, um, 53 Cliff Avenue tax map U01 lot 83 for a conditional use permit for an accessory dwelling unit. 
consistent with the findings of fact on which the board has already voted. So moved. Uh, motion, Mr. Keneally. A second. A second. Mr. Tranfaglia. Um, discussion on the motion. All those in favor? The motion is approved by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. Mr. Hill, your application is granted. I want to thank the board for being so thorough. Well, thank you for bearing with us so patiently. <laughs> Bruce, the next time we come across this, we're all set, right? <laughs> Not necessarily. Now, next item on the agenda is, at least on the agenda as written, is to hear an administrative appeal by Cross Hill, LLC, of the Code Enforcement Officer's February 4, 2003 decision to withhold certificate of occupancies for lot 26 and 27 of tax map U58 and lots 2021 20, and 25 of tax map U59 until after the second floors are finished for use as additional bedrooms. And we have received a request from Cross Hill to continue that matter uh, by letter uh, dated March 19 and Mr. Smith has replied by letter dated March 24 to Cross Hill um, with a letter that says dear Mr. Parkhurst this is a response to your letter of March 17, 2003 in which you have requested a postponement of your March 25 administrative appeal to the April meeting on behalf of David Backer, this is to inform you that it is common practice to allow an item to be postponed upon request of the appellant. Therefore, as requested, your, administ your administrative appeal will be heard on April 22, 2003. Signed, sincerely, Bruce Smith, Code Enforcement Officer. So that matter has been delayed to the April hearing. Um, next item on our agenda is communications. Review of sections 19-4-3B2 and 19-7-10. And we have in our packets a memorandum from the code enforcement officer indicating that the planning board has asked the zoning board of appeals to review those stated sections of the ordinance. And the memo says, I believe that the planning board may be looking for input from the Zoning Board of Appeals on how the section, how often the sections are used, whether there is a real need for those sections to remain, and if so, how can they be rewritten? Now, I read Mr. Hill's December 30, 2002 letter that's attached to this, and I read the sections. And I wonder whether this is the right time and place for us to respond to this or whether it's something that more appropriately, appropriately should be in a workshop with Mr. Hill. Bottom line, um, this is the only opportunity for input. Planning board's moving on this. And it's either now or never. Well, when you say... Excuse me? I didn't understand what you said. Can you repeat that? The bottom line is planning board's moving on this. Um, and this, this, so this is your only opportunity tonight to comment on whether you have, you think the section 19.4 B3 is warranted or if you, if you, if you don't, then. Well, when you say the planning board is moving on this, what does that mean? The, the, this is the only opportunity for, for the board to, to comment before they 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 uh, start uh, discussions. More appropriately, if you don't if you don't want to review this, you might want to participate at the planning board level in these sections. 
the reason why they that the plan board has asked you to comment on this is simply because of the statements made at the joint workshop that 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 certainly council and plan board wants the board of appeals to to comment when they see issues in the audience that they may need to be addressed and that's why plan board extended the offer for anybody to to comment on what they may see as issues or not issues in relation to do these two sections is the proposal to just delete section no no the proposal Mike Hill has found issue with those sections in the in regards that they may not be legal they may not stand it up in court and he's pointed those sections out so now the plan board has to take a look at at if we really want those sections if they really wanted to stay then how how do we how do we make them work and still protect ourselves from court cases based on what's already happened with the with Perkins versus the town of Gunkwood and in the York case so it's just it they extended an invitation for 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 the board to have some input and certainly the board probably could you know if they don't want to discuss it tonight they can certainly can you know probably go to some of the plan board workshops on these sections well my sense again from reading through this is that it's this probably isn't a very effective time to try and analyze these and figure out what input should be given to the planning board I really feel like this is something that falls more within the town attorneys it's gonna start to say the town council meaning town legal councils purview to do the legal analysis and tell the planning board whether there are problems here that well wire change I I don't disagree with that I mean I'd express my opinion that this section is 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 not used enough to make it worthwhile and because it's challengeable because it's not doesn't fall into the variance criteria that that my recommendation to the plan board would be to eliminate the section and simply have variances because there are two issues of this one the biggest issue is that it it waived it waived standards based on something other than a variance and that in itself goes against what's already been proven to be a problem in two other towns which which is open to challenge so rather than try to rewrite this and I don't know how you could rewrite it without putting it under the variance which we've already got there my recommendation would be to simply eliminate the section and you're referring only to 19-4-3 b2 that's what I'm referring to at this point yes excuse me I think that's a great idea to just eliminate it I think that's the answer because we've already got a section where people can can go to seek remedy from a relief from the audience what would be what would be the implications of eliminating it then if someone wanted to increase the height well for example the only thing this does for you or what this does for you well let's back up this section you can do this you could go before the board as a variance and get exactly what this section does what this section does for somebody is allows them to go to the board providing they're not increasing the height and providing they're not making more non-conforming meaning closer to the property line without having to meet the variant standards and 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 the court cases that's proven that you that that's not a method that will stand up and and meet the true test so in other words if you approve somebody under this standard goes to court the court's going to probably overturn the board's approval because it's not legal based on the Perkins and the York cases that the plan boards or Board of Appeals can't waive standards the only authority given by the audience 
is through a variance process with the Board of Appeals and not from another board or through another method. So this is repetitive in that it, in, and the reason why it was in there was to ease up the standards for some people who weren't going to increase the height and weren't going to go closer to the, to the line. They can still do that under variant standards. It's just that it's a harder standard to meet. So this was put in here to ease the burden for whatever reason. So if we eliminate B2, then they what, still is, have the opportunity. what does the ruling statement fall back to then? If this is repetitive, what does it fall back to? Variance. Undue, undue hardship, practical difficulty. All right. For example, if someone wants to increase the height of, an, of a structure within a non-conforming lot, how would that be approached then? If they wanted to increase the height, which this states cannot be done. Well, it isn't. It isn't. Increasing the height is not the issue. The increase, adding, adding on within a setback is the issue. And to use this section in order to add square footage on, two things have to happen. And, and that uh, two things can't happen. One, you can't go closer to a property line. And two, you can't go upwards. According to B2. Right. So somebody wouldn't come to increase the height. They'd come to do an addition. And they could use the section presently, rather than a variant <laughs> standard, providing they didn't increase the height and providing they didn't go closer to a property line. They can still do that under variance criteria anyways. The problem is they have to meet the undue hardship, which is a high standard compared to this section. But the opportunity for anybody to get relief from the ordinance is in the ordinance in its entirety, including this section under the variance standards. So the, and any, any, any citizen would not be losing any right uh, to approach the board to get relief. It's just that they wouldn't have two avenues to get there. But converse to that statement then, would, would we be able to restrict a height addition within the setback zone, setback area? Under variance? If we struck B2, would someone then converse to, converse to what you just said, be able to indeed increase the height within that setback area? <laughs> well, well, I'm not sure that the issue is increasing the height. The, the well, issue that, was, that's one element of, of this. Well, it's one restriction that this, that, that this requires should you go through, should you want to take this approach to the variance. It's a restriction that's already imposed within the context of this section. Whereas under variance, undue hardship, practical difficulty, you just ask for variance and, and, and your variance is granted on the merits of the application meeting the standards of, of the particular section. So it isn't, it isn't something that the town, I think the town made the section, but because they want to do something to make it easier, but the trade-off was they were concerned that the height might be overbearing and so they wanted to limit it to what was already existing. So I think they, they backed into that. I don't think that was the, the, the issue, if that's what you're trying to. I mean, if somebody goes to the Board of Appeals for variance, you look at the overall project. You don't look at, you don't look, they don't approach you to, to increase the height on the variance. They approach you to, to, yes, the height might be increased, but they approach you for variance to, to add square footage within a setback. And that may be, from one story to two story. So somebody, somebody currently now could not use this section to put a second story on because it would increase the height. But they can use the variant section to increase the square footage rather than use this section. Losing you? <laughs> I think you've lost me. Well, uh, uh, I keep referring to height. so. If you, this B2 specifically prohibits height increase within that section, uh, within that area, the setback area. Okay, if we eliminate B2, 
Can you restrict height on the variance? Can someone add a second floor within the setback area? Can they increase height? There if we eliminate this. If you eliminate this under variance, you can increase the height as you've always been able to increase the height. And, and we have permitted that by That's the correct. addition of a second story. That's correct. Non-conforming structure on a non-conforming lot. Still subject to the same 35 foot. We've specifically excluded that ability, correct, in the, based on this? No, no, because if you, if, you, if you want to increase the height, you simply go move to the variant section. You don't go here. This is a lesser and easier standard to meet, providing you don't increase the height and don't go close to the property line. You can use the standard. But that doesn't mean that you can't. If you're going to increase the height, you just move to the variance section automatically. You, skip, you don't go here. And that variance section would be what? What is the number of that variance section? That this would well, it's 19, 19 5 is the chapter. Okay. Variance. Just the practical difficulty standard practical that difficulty we routinely consider. consider. So this is more of an undue hardship. We're eliminating the undue hardship aspect. We're doing what? No, not eliminating, no. Undue hardship or practical difficulty. In regards to this? You don't have to meet undue hardship or practical difficulty in this section at all. No. That's, that's it's, what it's I mean. Less, it's an fine. easier standard to meet, but the trade-off is that you can't increase the height nor go closer to the property line, whereas a variance is a harder standard to meet, but you do have the opportunity to, to increase the height and go closer to the property line. So you can do everything in, in the variance section. You can only do, do an addition within a setback if you're not increasing the height or going close to the property line in this section. So it's a repeat with, less, with the easiest standards to meet. So by eliminating B2, you consider this that we would be eliminating an easier approach to achieving the variance. An easy approach with the trade-off. An easier yes. approach would be eliminated. Right. right. And if you rewrote, if you leave it, you're going to have to rewrite it to fall under the variance. So, and you've already got the variance section. So I don't know how you could, if this that will, doesn't stand up in court and it has to fall into a variance, then there really is no need for this section. Bec unless you could write, rewrite it to stand <coughs> up in court, which unless it falls in the variance, the cases that's already come before the court recently say that, that it's illegal and they're kicking them back and saying, you, people, you've got to change your ordinance. And, they're, and it's, they're saying it's not permissible because the only way we can grant that kind of a change is through a variance. The only way anybody can get relief from the ordinance is through a, a, an appeal from the Board of Appeals, not a waiver from the plan board, nor a waiver from the Board of Appeals as this section would allow. So why expend the labor to rewrite this when the opportunity exists elsewhere in the ordinance? Is that and how would you rewrite it without kicking it in the variance <clears throat> section anyways? Uh, that's, that's my feeling on this. I don't see, one, the need is not, I mean, we probably had three applications in the five and a half years I've been here, maybe four. Recent, in recent years, in the last year or two, I don't think we've had any. So it's not used, it's used rarely, and it's open to challenge in the courts. And I don't know how you'd write it without kicking it in the variance anyways. Uh, so my recommendation would be to eliminate it. Eliminate the possibility of enlarging, throw it into the Board of Appeals variant standards. And that seems to be what Mr. Hill's recommendation is, is that we scrap that section and rely upon the variance. Is that what he said? Is that what he said? Um, well, it seems to be in his letter. On, this, on the second page, the top, the top of the second page. Yeah, he says the court may find this to be impermissible. I would also note that the town has since adopted the practical difficulty standard for a variance, which may make it easier for an applicant to obtain such a variance the side of rear setback requirement. So I would find implicit in that that he's acknowledging that that section probably isn't needed. So in all, in all cases, 
these issues would still become would still come before this board. That's correct. And by the time we get through, there may be more issues that come before this board. We would just not, so that I understand, we could just not view it. We would not be able to view it under B2. We would have to review. Under, under the umbrella of a variance. We'd have to review it elsewhere. But in all cases, they would still, be, still come before this board. Correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's talk about 197-10 then. As long as we're so, is it is talking it, about this? Can we can we can we make? I mean, I've got to do a memo back to the plan on this. So, is it the board's wishes that this section be looked at to possible possible elimination? Do you want us to vote on that, Bruce? Well, I'd like to have. I'd like to be able to put it in a memo form that we had the discussion and that may have been some outcome. You don't have to. You don't have to decide that, that that it should be eliminated. You could word it such that 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 maybe there isn't a need for this section, and, and that your recommendation is that is that uh, the plan board looks at it to to possibly eliminate if it if it if it overlaps what we already have under the variant section. I'd recommend we eliminate it. So. I, mean, I, I didn't know that you wanted to go that far. I, I see. I saw hesitation, so I was trying to come up with an old point. Based on the discussion we've just had, I can't think of any compelling reason why it should stay. Okay. That's the, that's the, that's the general consensus of the board. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Agreed. 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 Good. Good. All right. Then could you? You said that. B2 is an easier approach to obtaining this variance. Well, no, it isn't a variance, so that's why in nat by, by its sheer nature it's easier. Then can you explain the Mr. Hill's comment that says, I would also note the town has since adopted the practical difficulty standard for variance, which, which may make it easier for that applicant to obtain such a variance to the side of rear setback requirement. Why does he note that, that the other? That's his opinion that the practical difficulty is easy to meet in Hindu hardship. I'm not so sure that that's a true statement. And then this board has proved that through, through denials of practical difficulty. So, I mean, everybody right along has said that, that, that because you don't have to meet the number one question on the undue hardship that the land in question will not yield a reasonable return without the variance, meaning you have to prove to the board that the property is virtually worthless because you don't have to meet that so hard a standard on the practical difficulty that it's automatically easier. I think it's a more reasonable standard to meet, but I'm not sure that somebody would go so far as to, I wouldn't go as far as say it was easy. Um, but that's that practical difficulty is, is on the books as as a variance outside of shoreland zone. Undue hardship is still a variance within shoreland zone. But it's your opinion overall that that by eliminating B2 will not necessarily make it more convenient, more easy, easier, no. or more convenient for someone to for those the variance. For those people who want to increase square footage within a setback and not go close to the property line and not go upwards, it, it will be a harder standard, practical difficulty will be a harder standard to meet, no doubt. The point is the Supreme Court will, will not uphold it unless it also, unless they believe it would also pass the variance. Right, and, right. and the only standard you that's can- That's the key point. That, that's the, the key point is that, 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 that the court has determined that only, waivers can only be granted as variances to the Board of Appeals. And variances can only be administered through the language that the state has required that every town adopt, and that's either practical difficulty or undue hardship. So the board's hands are tied. They can't create new variant standards for this section. So I don't see how they can rewrite this. No, I don't see how they can leave it in here because of that. And if we can just, re I think, repeat for the record, I think the, the practical difficulty standard isn't a lesser standard than undue hardship. I, mean, I think since we've 
uh, changed our approach to that. And actually, we, we met uh, this past spring, I think, with the town council and actually reviewed um, you know, the number of variances that have been granted with the, the newer approach, the practical dif difficulty versus undue hardship. We really haven't seen a difference in our numbers. And I think the vigorous uh, review process uh, uh, is still in place. I don't think it's a weaker. I think it's actually more realistic uh, <coughs> and more practical, as the name applies. So I mean, I'm, I'm in full agreement with you no, say tonight. No, that's the yeah, point. In some cases, more stringent, actually, too. Yeah. 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 But I also think it brought a, a greater degree of measurement, too, so the folks Absolutely. coming before the board had a better idea of what to expect and, and yeah. to make their case. Do you know why this was enacted three years ago, less than three years ago? Do you know why it was enacted at that point? What was enacted? Well, the uh, B2, number 5, August of 99. We're still, we're still on 19.43. Yep. <laughs> uh, three and I had moved years, on. <laughs> three and a half years ago. And so was number 6, so was number 7. That I um, was one that, what that did, it wasn't enacted. It, it cleaned the language up. The language was confusing, and it was reworded. Um, to be less confusing and more user-friendly. So there was really no change to that section in 99, only a clarification of what was already there. So. Okay, can we look at 19-7-10? Reductions in setbacks on page 152. Starts at the bottom of 152 and goes on to 153 and 154. And Mr. Hill's letter says, I also have some concern with section 19-7-10 reductions and setbacks, the ability of the code enforcement officer or the zoning board of appeals to reduce the setback pursuant to that section may be held to be impermissible. I, I'll, if I may, I'll say the same spiel, that, that this section allows something to be done waiving the standards, um, not through a Board of Appeals variance process. And I think we run into the same issues should we leave this in. Um, it does the same thing that the variance does, only it does it easier. And there may be some history that the citizens or the writers of this ordinance wanted that to happen, but unfortunately, because of the court cases, I think it, I think it's problematic. Well, no, there have been times, as I recall, Bruce, that we've been asked to grant a variance for some amount of a, an increased or some amount of a reduced setback, and we've questioned, you know, how close we can go, and I think there your answer at times to that question has been to point us to this section um, and tell us that it can't be reduced to less than 50% of the required setback um, and in no case, you know, less than 10 feet. I know a variance. That's when it applies for this. Yeah, it's only when, the, the only when they apply. apply. Either a variance or a setback reduction, so they don't overlap. Two well, maybe that's right. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have referred you to this section. Okay. Well, maybe that's, you've just referred to that in, in setback reductions then. You would, would hear this if, if uh, there was information that, that it didn't meet the standards of Section 19.55, um, and you'd hear it to make a determination whether it did meet the condition view standards of 19.55. Well, I, I stand rather than the variance. Um, this whole section is problematic under the, under the latest court cases. Yeah, I, I stand corrected. You're, you're right. That wouldn't come up in a variance. Well, this, this is a nice handy way to, to, to let somebody deviate from the ordinance. I never agreed that it's appropriate from the day I took over, but it was in there, and I've used it on several occasions. Um, 
Is the re recommendation to eliminate 710 also? I don't see what, what other thing we can do. It's, it's going to, if you keep it, you're going to have to throw it. The only thing you can do is throw it into the variant standards, um, which, is, which is, it already covers. So. But then what will happen if someone wants to put an accessory building on the property line? They may do that. What governs it? Well, I, I should elaborate. The accessory building of 150 square feet could be incorporated into 19, uh, 197, um, which is the, or 196, I mean, which is the setbacks. For instance, under, under 1970, it's got the different different uh, districts. And, and, and one of the setbacks uh, that they talk about, that they segregate, is accessory buildings 100, 100 square feet or less and not greater than eight and a half feet. They, they, are, they have a reduced setback compared to garages and houses. So the accessory building 150 square feet could be incorporated into that section so, so that, so that the, the, set, the specific setback for an accessory building up to 150 square feet would be found in that section. That would be legal. You say it is? It is incorporated in It that. isn't, but it could be such as 100 square foot accessory buildings are now with reduced setbacks. Less than 150 feet? Uh, right now, you can get a 10 and 5 foot setback for a 100 square foot build, uh, shed in the, in the district setbacks as a Pacific standard. You could put the same, you could put the same one or, or all these into that section and have reductions for 150 square foot buildings. Is that for us to do? Or to recommend? To recommend. I, I think you should recommend that that, that that shouldn't be handled in the 19710. And if you also want to go a step further and say that, but maybe the plan board should look at, at allowing this in another section that would be legal, such as 1996, 19, then, then, then you suggest that. Uh, but I think you ought, to, you ought to at least say that the section, this section shouldn't be here. Just for clarity, if it's over 150 feet, what, what governs it? For the purposes of this section, I can only grant 50% reductions if it's not over 150. If Anything over 150 has to meet the, the district setbacks. So if it's over 150 feet, uh, square feet, it has to meet the setbacks for the district. That's correct. As, as if it were a dwelling unit. Right. My recommendation to the planning board on this particular issue is, is, to, is to have them at least look to see if, the, if, if they want to place this in another section of the audience that would make it legal and let them run with that. Um, but, but, I, I, but, but, but as far as the board's concerned, you may not even care about going that far. You may say that based on the merits that the the fact that the section wouldn't be legal in the court, it's no different than 1943B2 and therefore should be eliminated. Was that going to be your recommendation, Bruce? Yes. I support that. I think these, I think all of these are significant issues that mm -hmm. will certainly affect the, the flavor of any neighborhood and should be addressed and should be addressed with uh, you know, properly. Uh, otherwise, you have sheds on property lines and things of this nature that, that will affect the nature of a neighborhood or any neighborhood. I, so if, if we are being asked to remove this section because of its inability to stand up in court, then it's my opinion that all of these items should be addressed elsewhere with, with with significant, and at your recommendation as to the appropriate wording to, to do or section to do that, so that the section shouldn't be here, but possibly look at moving these to a, another place, or at least entertaining that. Bruce, in the five years that you've been here, have you used Section C? To any significant degree? Well, see, uh, did he directly? 
I think I'm not sure that, he, that 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 part is included in this whole scheme. It may be, but I'm going to fight hard to keep that. I can see it as being beneficial because it's more of an administrative application. Yeah, I mean, if you've got something that's 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 on the face of the earth and has been here for for at least uh, prior to 1997, eight years state. now, um, it has to be local. It has to be some kind of remedy, and and certainly nine times out of ten, you can't meet a variant standard, and that means consent agreements. And and I can tell you one thing: the council will only want to entertain consent agreements for something that can't be handled otherwise in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I certainly want to talk to Mike whether C can remain, right. but it's my feeling that without that, then, then that's going to be a real hardship on a lot of people who are, who, are, who are refinancing or selling because they have no recourse but to go before the council. Be, or they could take it to the board, but truly 90% of them won't meet standards for variance, which means, you know, $2,000 and up consent agreement through fine through the council. I agree with you as well, but it is part and parcel of uh, section 19710. I hope, I hope you would recommend to strike. I was hoping you wouldn't notice that. Well, I, I find that one to be more of an, an administrative application and it seems to have its value and, sh and I think it should be retained. So we're talking A and B to strike, right? I, I would go along with that. And see there should be some local remedy and through the through the office that was something that already exists i mean this that that hasn't really been challenged most towns have some kind of a mechanism and there's some kind of magic date and every town's different it might have been an ordinance rewrite it may have been a zoning change it may have been setback change but some almost every town has some kind of a a, a date that that, that, they, that they sign off because it comes up so often so well, that's it. The, 10, will we have any mechanism for doing that? Excuse me? If we strike all of 10, will we have any mechanism for doing that? No. So let's keep C then. Thank you. <laughs> we'll fight for that. Now, we had one of those issues come before us last year. Was that must have been a property. Was that a property that after was built nine, after April 1? After 97. This is a parallel tangential point of interest here. Uh, someone wants to put just a shed up, you know, small sheds, 10 by 10, no foundation. Do they have to come to you for permit for that? Sure. They do. The structure has to be setbacks. So even if it's not on foundation, it still has to. Right. I mean, you don't have a you don't have a big life safety issue there, because it's not for habit habitable space. But you do have setback issues, and you do have you do want to make sure that the shed will withstand a, a snowstorm. Um, not necessarily to protect life, but just to, to make sure it doesn't fall down. So, yeah, it used to be there was a, a monetary value. You know, the old standard was if it's less than $300, it didn't need a permit. And that's long gone. Most Anything that's considered a structure by definition needs a permit. Tree houses will exempt them. <laughs> well, you remember that episode over in Portland a few years ago where the, where the treehouse was built and the neighbor complained it was too close to the line and the court officer took action and the kid, you know, had to remove his treehouse or get a variance and there was, oh, there was just a nightmare. <laughs> I'd hate to bet in their shoes. So are you clear on what you're going to do with 19-7-10? Yeah, everything. Every basically what the board's recommending, and I and I I go along with is, is eliminating everything except for section C on both sections. I'll put it. I'll, you know, I'll do a, a little memo that's going to explain the reasons why. And okay. And will you provide us with a copy of yes, sir. that at the next for our next meeting? Yes, sir. Thank you. And you, you will recommend that these issues be addressed elsewhere in the appropriate district zone? Yeah. Yes, I'll add that, too, that, that there was some sentiment that, 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 they, that the plan board should look at maybe moving them to another section um, because 
because of the sheer nature, it's not an intrusive structure, for instance, 150 square foot, I guess, something to that effect. Specifically, the, the deck, the accessory building, and outdoor recreational facility. Yeah, I think they might have a problem with the deck, because that can be a real nightmare if you have different setbacks for that, simply because a lot of people turn decks into living space, and that would be a tracking nightmare. So I would, my recommendation would be not to include the decks in that, but, but, uh, but include structures that, that can easily be monitored based on their size. So at, at least accessory buildings and number two and number three. Right. Under A. And possibly, what's the other one, swimming pools and tennis courts? Funny thing is, I don't recall having issued for tennis court, but I know they go up every year. <laughs> Most people don't think that tennis court's a, a structure, and I wouldn't have thought it if it hadn't been in that section. So maybe if it's not in that section, I won't have to worry about it. <laughs> I don't know. What percentage of sheds in the town come before you? Excuse me? What percentage of sheds in this town do you think have come before you for? Oh, I'd like to think all of 100%, but we know better. Yeah, it's quite an issue. OK, any other communications? Not. None? I have none. I have a question. Is this our, this is our recommendation, our opportunity to recommend to the board, planning board changes or issues? Well, if you have others, if you have others uh, that you have issues or changes, certainly. Well, there was one identified tonight regarding a signed and sealed survey. I mean, that, that was a contentious issue tonight. Should we recommend that that is only, uh, I'm referring to 1975B1, where it, uh, the lot area should be established by signed and sealed survey? Should we only request that if, if, if there's a, dis a relevant discrepancy? The discrepancy I, I think issue, the, the discrepancy referred to tonight, either way you look at the discrepancy, it was in favor of the applicant. So I didn't, I didn't consider that relevant. I think from my standpoint, I think it's, it, it's not worth going through the process of changing the wording and try to explain all that for something that, 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 that really is, hasn't been an issue and that can continue to function the way it is. I mean, I think it's the discretion of the board if they have a problem to send the applicant away. Right. Uh, and, if, and if they don't have a problem, then, then go ahead and prove it. Um, so you, you recommend leaving it like it is, even though- I, I don't it's see it as a problem. I think the board has is, 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 is just what they've done tonight, today, tonight is have pretty much decided what they probably will do in the future. If they're not comfortable, then they're not going to require more than that. Or they could, if they want to start requiring surveys from this day on based on the ordinance, they certainly can do that too. Just let me know and I, I, can, uh, I can see that that happens. If this isn't a request though, a blanket broad request for recommendations from us as to changes to the overall ordinance. It isn't or it is? It, it isn't. Not really, but they, they will be looking at other things, and if there's something that really is a problem, they, they'll certainly give that, that time. So if you do see something in there, then, yeah, bring it forward. Either I've always uh, wondered about the uh, close personal relationship requirement for the accessory dwelling unit. <laughs> you, you, before you go anywhere with that, you want to look at the history, because they, they, they did that on purpose. They actually worded that to allow somebody that wasn't a relative to live in that accessory dwelling unit. And if you look back at, at all of you, and, and I've talked to Maureen about this because I've always had that same problem. And you well, look Well, there back may very well have been a reason, but what we've created is an absolutely unenforceable standard. Even if it's, if it, even if it's uh, uh, limited to family members, it's almost unenforceable unless somebody brings it to your attention, you know. Either way, if it's advertised in the paper and I catch up on it, 
you know, I can nail him. But short of that, I don't know that the relatives stay in here, and I'm not going to make an issue until I know of that. So it really, it's a problem in any way. Accessory dwelling units in lower apartments have always been a problem, no matter where you go. I hear you. <laughs> no, my, my point is merely that it is an unenforceable standard. And you defined well, it well the first time we had to deal with it. I, I agree with what David's saying, and you might carry that message by itself to the planning board that we consider that standard unenforceable and meaningless. They knew exactly what they were doing when they made that wording. Well, you're talking about someone, some music. I'm talking about the people who were on the who were on the rewrite committee for that section. They knew exactly what Is that they were the doing. Current planning board. No, but it was the wishes of the townspeople who, who worked on that. It may have been. Uh, well, was there a special set of reasons related to special people at the time? It's my understanding that, 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 that the reason why they expanded that beyond relationships was that one, in itself, it was un unenforceable, and they realized that, but they do, did need to make a, rec a, a mechanism for people to take care of their own. And they felt that it didn't really make any difference whether, whether you was a cousin or whether you were a friend. Um, they were going to allow it anyways. And, I, and beyond that, I don't know the reason, but I do know it, it was, there was, from what I understand, there was strong sentiment in, into allowing, in allowing that wording to go in. Where did, do, you know, do you know enough about it, where they felt the line should be drawn? I, I can only tell you that, that from what I, my understanding is that it, that, that it was extended to people that weren't relatives. That's all I can tell you. And that was intentional. That's all I can tell you. Well, I, I hear what you're saying, but do you, did they have any sense about where the line really should be drawn? <laughs> well, by opening it up to other than relatives, there's no line, is there? Well, that's what I'm thinking. No. 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 And, and, so and, the and language may as well not be there at all. <laughs> and we had, it, we had it come up in the context of a tenant who had been leasing, paying rent for 10 years. There's no Over the course of that 10 years, they had never had approval for an accessory dwelling unit. And somebody pointed it out to them, and they came to us, and they said, you know, this guy's been renting from us for 10 years. He's become a close friend as a tenant over those 10 years, and he's going to continue to pay us rent. Yeah. But, he's a close per but he's a close acquaintance, or whatever it is, simply because he's been with us for so long as a tenant. What, what that was the height of absurdity. And you know how many, and you know how many apartments are out there that's probably not uh, just like that? that I know, and, I, and we shouldn't get into this whole discussion. But. <laughs> what, what's the, what's the, there's another provision that I didn't understand. What is the rationale for not permitting a home business? In an accessory dwelling unit, you mean? Home business? They have both? We could create so much traffic as the uh, safety has in the neighborhood. Uh, could have some chemistry affluence that would be considered uh, not good for the environment. But you could have pre-existing home business, and then you want to have a relative move in with you, and then you have to discontinue that home business. Oh, I see what you're saying. Relative. You have to make a choice. Yeah. yeah. I beg your pardon? You have to make a choice. Right. Uh, obviously, under, under the order, and, 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 I'm just asking, what, what's the rationale? Well, I think, from from what I understand, the rationale now is that, that as Jack said, um, the citizens or the writers of the audience which represent the citizens um, wants the town to remain as residential in character as possible. And by, by allowing two uses in a residential neighborhood, then that, in, in most people's mind, that becomes, it's starting to overwhelm the principal use as a, as a residence, a residence, and so I believe that's why they made the trade-off that, that 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 you can't have both. You know, they felt that 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 becomes more too intensive on a, on a residential lot to have a business and another dwelling unit, especially on a lot that's only 12,000 square feet. I mean, I can only speculate, but I suspect that's probably what they were thinking. Just limits the commercial intensity. 
humans. You can only have one thing that has commerce orientation, either your home business or an accessory dwelling unit, which may be rental. Okay. Well, so you kind of two different commerce oriented uses on the same lot. This is in the context of the residential zone. And the more modifications you make to it, the more you're really stretching the initial you know, identity of what residential A, B, and C are. Over here, <laughs> Dr. Chapman, in Mr. Hill's letter, he mentioned besides the two sections that were on the agenda to review, he also mentioned 1972 and 79. What? It's all planning board. Plan board. Has no bearing on us at all. He. Um, I didn't think. I don't think he asked for your input in that particular section because it, it wasn't directly related to what you, the board does. It's good. It's good that the that, that the plan board's extending that to this board because that, you know, it's nice to have the boards work together, and that hasn't always been the case in here or in other towns. So it it, it I think it's great that they're looking for you guys to to give them some guidance. Well, tell them that we appreciate the opportunity for the input. I we have a motion for adjournment. So moved. So moved, Mr. LaPlante. Second. I'll second it. Second. Um, who seconded that? Joe. Joe. Um, I didn't put a pin for your mic. Um, all those in favor? We are adjourned. <laughs>